Hello folks, this is Mike. Thanks for tuning in. Well, in this video today, we're going to talk about this baby here. Now, this is the ShopFox W1704 8 by 13 inch mini lathe. We're going to unbox it, we're going to set it up and assemble it, look at how it works, and then we're going to actually turn some wood on it, including a 7 and a quarter inch bowl. And we're going to see how it does. And then we're going to discuss pros and cons, and we're going to decide whether this is a good lathe for you or not. So, let's get started. Now, I wasn't sure which lathe I was going to buy. I was considering several different mini lathes in this price range. And this one normally sells for a little under $300. But Amazon made my mind up for me. I went on there one day, and this was on sale for $211, so I jumped on it. <laughs> and I purchased it with my own money. Uh, that's important because I want you to know that I'm not being paid by ShopFox or by Amazon or compensated in any way by any other vendor to make this video. So I can be honest, and that's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you what I really think of this product at the end of this video. So be sure to stick with me, and I'd appreciate it if you would like my video, subscribe to my channel, and ring that bell. So let's get started, and let's see what's in the box. The machine comes in a factory shipping box, and there's styrofoam between the outer box and the inner box. Uh, the inner box, when you open it, there's a lot more styrofoam in it. Uh, so hopefully when the delivery guy tosses this onto your porch, it won't get damaged. There's a manual, and it's written entirely in English, which is a little unusual. The accessories all have their own little section, uh, and they come in plastic bags, but I won't make you watch me open those right now. We'll look at them later. Having a bad back, I found the easiest way to get it out of the box was to stand the box on its side, and then I could slip it out and onto the table. Remember, it does weigh over 40 pounds. So now we can remove all this plastic and here it is. So let's look at the accessories before we go on. Now this is your face plate. Uh, this is a five inch face plate for turning uh, bigger stuff. You get a MT1 live center and you get an MT1 spur center. There's a seven inch tool rest and a four inch tool rest. Get a lock handle, one for the quill, and one for the rest, tool rest. This is your knockout tool. Your adjustment wrench. You get two hex wrenches. And finally, you get two lock handles, one for the tool rest and one for the tailstock and you'll notice there's a spring and a nut with each one. We'll show you how to put those on later. So that's basically it. So let's move on and I'll show you how to assemble it. Before we start on assembly, I'd like to tell you a few really basic things about the lathe first. Now this is considered an 8 by 13 inch lathe. Now what that means is that you can cut a maximum diameter of 8 inches and a maximum length of 13 inches between the two centers. Now, also, this unit has a one-third horsepower motor, and it has a variable speed control, which is one main reason I bought this lathe. I'm sick of changing belts, okay? But this will take you from 750 RPMs all the way up to 3200 RPMs. And also, there's very little plastic and aluminum in the lathe. Uh, most of the construction here, even the centers, uh, this part, this part, this part, all steel or cast iron, which I think is great. Now the base itself is 23 and a half inches by 5 and 1 8 inches. From the back of the quill assembly to the face of the motor box is 28 inches. From the table to the top of the quill lock will require 12 and a half, 13 inches. Another big factor to think about is the travel of your tool rest. 
This will go way behind the lathe. You'll need to allow about five, five and a half inches behind the lathe before you get to a wall or an obstruction. It also takes about seven inches in front. So that's something to consider when you're setting this up. So now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and get it assembled. Before we start assembly, the first thing we should do is plug it in and make sure it works. So ShopFox recommends a startup speed of 750. So we set it there, flip the switch, and it works. <laughs> and you can hear it rev up as I turn the dial up to the 3200 RPM setting. And if there, it, it seems pretty smooth and pretty quiet. Now the next thing we need to do is insert the spur in the live centers and slide the tailstock forward to check alignment. The two points should touch tip to tip. I was concerned because they were a bit off, but when I tightened down the tailstock, uh, they pulled right into alignment. So if your lathe fails this test, you may have a defect, so you need to contact ShopFox and or the vendor you bought it from. This is the knockout tool and it's designed to remove your centers or whatever you have in the chuck and tailstock. But in actual use, you will probably have to tap the ball on the end of the tool with a hammer uh, because the accessories, being a friction fit, just won't budge otherwise. Now I am just checking to make sure the spindle and the tool rest base move freely and work properly. There are two lock handles supplied uh, one fits in the threaded hole in the tailstock, and when it's uh, run in, it locks the spindle in place. The other fits in the side of the tool rest base, and when you drop in the tool rest, it should be able to lock it in place. You get two adjustable levers, and they fit on the hex nuts on the tool rest base and on the back side of the tailstock. There's also a cone shaped spring that fits in the socket at the top of the handle with the wide end down in the socket and with the narrow end facing up and under the screw head. If you install it properly, you can push down on the screw head and it will depress the spring up and down. This allows you to depress the spring and turn the handle without engaging the nut. If you want the nut to turn, you just don't press in the spring. To turn between centers, we'll take a square cut workpiece and then mark center. And if you don't have a measuring tool like this, you can just use the straight edge. Now take a punch and hammer a dimple in the dead center. Now turn the piece and repeat the procedure on the other side. And if you don't like using a punch, you can always use a drill and a drill bit. But your hole only needs to be deep enough to engage the center's point. Now take the spur center the one with the raised ridges on it, and tap it into the center dimple with a hammer. And it needs to make a good secure fit. So now we insert the spur center in into the headstock and slide the tailstock forward until you can get the point of the live center to seat in the dimple. Now lock down the tailstock and turn the wheel until the assembly is good and secure. You should have the feeling that you're pushing the piece into the headstock. Tighten the lock handle so the spindle can't move. Now you can position your tool wrist, but just make sure that when the lathe turns that it's not going to make contact with it. And now you're ready to start turning. This shop fox with its one-third horsepower motor has been criticized in some reviews for being underpowered. But to my knowledge, all of the 8-inch mini lathes on the market have a one-third horsepower motor. Uh, but let's go ahead and turn some wood with it and see how the lathe does. We're going to start by making a slimline riding pin. Now this requires a special mandrel set uh, that is not included with your lathe. To rough out the square pin blanks, I used uh, my big gouge with a light touch. And we're going to do this until we get the corners rounded off. And then I'm going to increase the speed maybe to 1200 RPMs maybe even more and use a bit more pressure. Now when I first started turning pins I thought I would need the smaller uh, pin turning chisels and I do use those but I like to start with a full size gouge. The cutting process was smooth and the lathe supplied plenty of power for this job and it was quiet there was little vibration 
And even though the lathe's not bolted down, it, it stayed put. Next, we lower the speed back down to 750 uh, for sanding and finishing. And I used a super glue finish here. Now, at this speed, uh, finishing is not a problem if you use uh, some finesse. And just remember that too much pressure can create too much heat. And then you'll end up with those dreaded white spots in your finish. Next, I tried a two inch square piece of cherry, about the size you would need to say, turn a set of salt and pepper shakers. I used a variety of chisels on the test piece and I had no problems with vibration, nor did the uh, lathe slow down as I applied pressure with the chisel. Next I tried a three inch diameter piece of yellow pine. And this is the same piece that we demonstrated with earlier in the video. Uh, the only difference is that I bobbed off the corners to make turning a little easier. Now I used the big gouge first again and then later I switched to my skew and I had no real problem here during the turning process. Other than that I was too rough on it, used too much pressure and I chipped up and gouged the piece up. Uh, but the main point is that in spite of this treatment uh, the lathe was up to the challenge. However the real test will be to cut a big bowl. The lathe has an 8 inch swing, but how does it turn out close to its maximum capacity? Well to test that I'm going to use this 5 inch supplied faceplate and I'm going to attach it to a 7.5 inch bowl blank. This one's made out of maple. The plate is attached to the blank using dome head wood screws. and You want to make sure you put all four in and make sure to get it as centered as possible or it will wobble and that's what we're going to do. Now we can spin the bowl blank onto the threaded spindle and tighten it into place. And to do that, we're going to use the knockout tool and the supplied wrench. Insert the end of the knockout tool in one of the holes in the spindle and then tighten with the supplied wrench. And you want to make sure it's good and tight. Now we can move our tool rest into place and we want to make sure that our chisels are really good and sharp. I set it at 750 RPMs and started trying to smooth down the rough blank. But it would tend to grab and either slow down or even stop the spinning of the lathe. Uh, this situation I'm not used to on my big lathe. My tool wrist is a little too far from the workpiece. Uh, this could be a contributing factor. Now this could be possibly because maybe my chisel wasn't as sharp as it should be. Although I sharpened before we started. So I reset my tool rest and I increased speed to about 1200 RPMs. And with a bit lighter pressure, the cutting was much, much smoother. When you put too much pressure, it will slow the lathe down. When you use full size chisels on the bowl front, as I'm doing here, uh, this tailstock will definitely be in the way. But this can easily be removed and uh, that's simply done by taking the stop off on the back of the lathe which is the little black plastic plate, uh, two screws. You just simply remove that and this tail stock will simply slide off. If you ever need to remove your tool rest, you can do it the same way. Working toward the middle of the bowl, I could really bear down on my chisels and remove a lot of material. It's only when you get closer to the outside edge of the bowl that you really have the slowing problem. A loose belt could cause this, so I laid the lathe on its side and checked it. Now the manual said that there should be about 1 8 inch of deflection with moderate pressure. So, and I had more than that. Uh, so to adjust the belt, I first marked the bottom of the flange as a reference point. I loosened the nut here on the side of the motor and with the supplied hex wrench. And I pushed the motor down and retightened. Now this took up the slack considerably. But unfortunately, the problem still persisted after that. Also, don't be tempted to over tighten the belt as it could cause premature bearing failure. Okay, that's much better. It's also a good idea to bolt the lathe to your workbench. Uh, when I turned it up to maximum speed, there was just enough vibration with this big workpiece on it that it tried to take a walk on me. Well, after using the lathe for six weeks, and after doing all of these tests, well, what is my opinion? What do I like and dislike? Well, what I like first, I like the general smoothness and the quietness with which the brave operates. I also like the low vibration. 
Well, I think that's great. I love the speed control. This is the main reason I bought the Life is I wanted variable speed. And uh, it's very, very smooth, very easy to use. I also like the tool rest. Now this is actually better thought out, better designed, and smoother than the one that I have on my big lay, for instance. And then I like the construction. At this price point, I would have expected a lot of plastic and aluminum. And that is just simply not the case. Most of the lathe, except for the speed control box and this cover, is all either cast iron or steel. I think that's great. Now, what do I dislike? Well, I've got a couple of small things. One is the speed control again. Now, it operates very well, but it's only marked at 3,200 and 750 RPM. So it would have been nice to see some more increments, maybe 1,200, 18, and 2,400. And that way, you would get more of an idea of what you're actually turning at, what speed. Then are these little spinning clamps. <laughs> And mainly that the balls loosen up and fall off, even at low vibration. And then I end up having to chase these little balls all over the shop. <laughs> so what I did here, was, and you may want to try this too, I wrapped the jaws of some pliers with uh, electrician's tape to protect the finish and not scratch these up. And I just simply tighten them really tight, and that's really helped. So the $64 question is, does this lathe have enough power to do the job? And the answer is, well, it depends on what you're going to do with it and what your craft is. Now, you saw that when we cut these big diameters that the lathe slowed down. So if you're a bowl turner and you're going to do a lot of this kind of work, I think probably you'd be better off with a bigger lathe, like a 12-inch mid-sized lathe or even bigger. Because you're not going to be happy cutting these little small bowls. Now, if you, this is just a one-off thing and you're going to cut the occasional bowl, you can manage this and uh, just finesse it, make sure your chisels are sharp, and just don't try to hog off a lot of material at one time. But that brings up a point. I'd like to know from my viewers how many people had this lathe and what sort of experience they're having cutting these large pieces. I think not only I would like to know that, but probably a lot of our viewers. But now for what I do, Cutting out to about four inch diameters. I make coffee grinders, pepper mills, writing pens, that sort of thing. And I think that's the highest and best use for this lathe anyway. Uh, it works fine. Uh, plenty of power. Um, it's, it's just a pleasure to use. And I'll give it a thumbs up for that purpose. Not a thumbs up for bowls, but a thumbs up for everything else. Now coming up, I'll be designing and building a sliding storage table for this lathe. I want to be able to incorporate it in my turning center, be able to pull it out over my big lathe, and then push it back out of the way. So I'll be designing and building something for that, and I'll be doing a video on that coming up. Also, there's a list of my upcoming videos at the end of this video in the credits, so watch for that. Now folks, I hope you've got something out of this video, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, please go below and like my video. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and be sure to ring the bell so you won't miss anything. And until next time, thanks for watching.